welcome to the Airline Weekly Lounge. I'm your host, Edward Russell, and I'm joined by my co-host, Jay Shabbat, to discuss JetBlue's earnings and the mess in New York this summer, and the outlook for WestJet. Thanks for listening. Please enjoy. Hey, Jay, how are you doing this week? Hey, Ned, welcome back. We uh, we missed you last week. We had a uh, an old friend aboard the uh, the podcast. Uh, we uh, you you may have heard of him. Yeah, you uh, you were able to speak to my old colleague Madhu. You're both of our old colleague Madhu, and I hear you guys had a good discussion about United and their earnings. Yes, we did. We did. That was a lot of fun. And I, I told him one of these weeks we'll have to get the three of us all on together. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So he can tell us all how the Boeing 747 is a janky bucket of bolts, <laughs> as he likes to say, and we can debate him on that. But that's for another podcast. <laughs> that's for another podcast. So this podcast, we're going to be talking about uh, two airlines in North America. One is JetBlue, and uh, we'll save the uh, the discussion on WestJet is the other one. We'll do we'll do them next. But uh, just to start off on JetBlue. They uh, reported earnings this week, and they weren't terribly good. They uh, they lost uh, about a hundred million dollars, one hundred eleven million dollars. That's uh, their net result stripped out, stripped uh, the special items accounting kind of mumbo jumbo. And uh, the um, operating margin for them was negative six percent. Uh, and just for comparison, United was negative point zero three percent or zero point three, sorry, and Delta was positive four point. Three, uh, Delta did pay quite a bit less for fuel. Um, they have that refinery that's going to help them out there. But uh, JetBlue, you listened to the call, Ned, and you even um, did an article for on our website that you all can see. Uh, was that Tuesday? Was it yesterday? I think we're we're talking uh, Wednesday. Tuesday, by the Tuesday. Way, but... So when people listen to this, it'll be a couple of days ago. But um, yes, you know it's it's funny. So as bad as the first quarter was for JetBlue, and uh, it. The topic really did not come up on the call. It's kind of like everyone had baked in a loss for the first quarter and forgot about it. Not to mention, no, you know, no mention the fact that JetBlue is a predominantly leisure focused airline with a heavy concentration in Florida and the Caribbean, all markets that should have been peaking in the first quarter. Um, that pretty much didn't come up on the call. Right, right. And I listened to the call as well. And they had mentioned that, uh, you know, they do seasonally, Q1 is the worst, which I. I went back and checked, uh, you know, in the past, and that's you know generally true. They do they do better in the spring and summer, despite having all that Florida and Caribbean. But I but I agree, Ned. I mean, I think I think they you you would one would think that they would have had a better Q1 given all of that Florida Caribbean exposure. They did have some operational issues. Fort Lauderdale had some big floods that closed the airport and whatnot. But but that, that uh, hit Q two. Remember that was in April. Was so, that in Q two? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, so that that's didn't even Q two. That didn't even uh, scar the Q one numbers exactly. So uh, good point. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it is what it is. And they um, you know they said they're cutting costs. They seem to be real bullish on this Northeast Alliance they have with American and. It's meaningfully program. contributing to their bottom line, uh, to quote uh, President Joanna Gergdy. Mm -hmm. which, which I believe, I mean, I can see that being strategically very valuable to them. Uh, and, uh, you know, of course, the, in the back of everyone's mind, I think, is, uh, you know, are they going to be asked to surrender that, to give that up in exchange for a appro conditional approval of their merger with Spirit? That's still all unfolding. We don't know where that's going to come out. But for now, they, you know, I think they're they're very happy with the Northeast Alliance. And as I mentioned, yeah, I think the other three kind of uh, areas of strength or or growth potential that they're banking on are, you know, number two, the loyalty program. Number three, their travel products division, which had a, which which I think includes like the vacation uh, package stuff, which does rather well for them. And then the the fourth item that was just the the cost cutting program that they have, right. Right. And, you know, it's it, cost cuts figured highly in the call. That's I mean, that's one thing I want to talk on the other thing. Uh, they said they've already realized 35 million in roughly 250 million in annual savings, and they expect 70 mil, an additional 70 million by the end of this year. So they're making some meaningful cuts, though. Management did mention that the pilot agreement that was ratified in January is going to significantly contribute to unit costs this year. So 
Still a lot of cost pressure at JetBlue. Uh, it's good that they're taking costs out of the business, uh, aside from labor and stuff, but they, they still face uh, a lot of headwinds. But uh, I'd like to, uh, to move, pivot from that. The main focus of their call was the situation in the New York area this summer. So as, as we've mentioned before, uh, the FAA has officially admitted to being understaffed in the New York, for air traffic controllers in the New York area. They only expect about 50 Four percent of staffing needed to be in place. As a result, they are allowing airlines to reduce schedules by up to 10%, suspending use it or lose it slot rules at the three main New York airports. Uh, despite this, JetBlue expects a very challenging summer for operations, especially in the New York area. And this is particularly a big deal for JetBlue, with, uh, which I checked, and according to DO, 50% of their schedule touches one of the three main New York airports. So that is is big, and they're definitely setting up for some potential disruption. It, it sounded rather foreboding. I, I, as I listened to that, I was kind of second guessing. I was asking myself, you know, do I want to fly this summer? This sounds pretty bad. And I live in a general New York area between New York and Philly, so um, that's airspace I may want to avoid this summer. Yeah, I have a quote here. It says. You know, we're, we're uh, I don't know who uh, this may have been. I can't remember who was speaking, but um, we're very concerned about New York City for the summer. Uh, and um, they, uh, they, the FAA has said that the lees are expected to vastly increase year for year. And I, I know some of you, who, um, if you looked at, uh, if you follow me on LinkedIn, I post a question every day. You guys can I'm always encourage you to um, answer my question about something something or another related to aviation. And, and the question I asked today was, uh, you know, and I'm going to pose this to you, Ned, as well. Same question is, uh, you know, because of what we're talking about, are, would you consider maybe not flying this summer or flying a little bit less? I mean, personally, I, I'm kind of I'm kind of put off by it. I don't know. I, I, I'm a little nervous. Well, you know what? I, I saw your question and I actually voted and my answer is no. But I, I my asterisk, my caveat is I live in the D.C. area and pretty much everywhere I fly does not need to pass through New York airspace. So I'm not mm -hmm. really too concerned about what happens in New York. That well, said, it sounds like it's going to be a challenging summer, especially for anyone who's affected by New York airspace. And I'd like to note that, like you said, Philadelphia is affected by what happens in New York airspace. Boston is affected by what happens in New York airspace. So if delays are going on in the New York area, that doesn't mean, I mean, they will ripple out. That is for sure. Right, right. Well, I'll mend my question a little bit for you, Ned. Would you uh, fly to or from New York? Would you book a flight in, you know, July for uh, New York to, to, to somewhere? Oh, gosh, no. Gosh, no. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I think we're on the same page there. Yeah. I <laughs> yeah, mean, that's... But the one thing that came to mind amid all this, you know, these warnings and, and comments of foreboding from JetBlue is, you know, the potential that they are setting the stage for better performance in the New York area. Now, now let's hear me out. You know, there is absolutely the case where, you know, JetBlue is going to pay a doomed to stay scenario for the New York area. So everyone's ready for delays and cancellations to be through the roof. Then delays and cancellations are bad, but maybe not as bad. And, and JetBlue comes out uh, looking OK in the end. Absolutely the they, potential yeah. for that. They could be, yeah, they could even be playing a little bit of the expectations game where they're kind of building everybody up to, you know, the investment community in particular. I don't know. I don't, you know, there's always a risk of scaring away passengers like me, but to the investment community, they may be just like, okay, we, this, this is going to, this is going to be really, really messy. And then it comes in a little bit less, uh, less messy and, you know, every... absolutely. Well, Jay, unfortunately, I have to admit, I think most travelers out there aren't like you or me. And, probably have no idea that this is all going on and will right. book their trips with few thoughts about this. So when things happen to get delayed and they're like, what's going on? What do you mean the air if FAA is understaffed? I I bet you that is going to be the majority of travelers this summer. But yeah, you know. especially <laughs> the summertime leisure travelers. There's a lot of people who just yeah travel once or twice a year and uh ex exactly so so they um yeah it's it, it, may, it may not be something that uh th th it may not be a message that's that's getting across but in any case yeah it will be it will be a challenge for JetBlue for sure and the other airlines that uh, have to deal with New York specifically and uh you know i'm sure the there are other por portions of the network and and let's not forget i mean Europe too could face these challenges and um i believe Wizz Air has has said that they're 
you know, they're, they're worried about the, uh, the upcoming summer. Um, so, you know, will it be as bad as last year? Last year, if you remember was, you know, that was headline making bad. Uh, you know, we'll see. It's, it's uh, it remains to see. be seen. Yeah. And, yeah. and I mean, it's other... already gathering headlines. We've, we've written about cuts in New York. People are reading all those stories heavily. It's, it's yeah, we will see. Yeah, yeah. You know, we're no. sitting in April and it's really hard to predict what happens. I think. Yeah. We're, few... I mean, we're writing headlines about what might be, and then we'll see if it actually comes to fruition. Now, now it's also, we, we remember that demand is going to play, is going to have an impact on the outcome as well. I mean, if demand Demand right now is still very, very strong, according to what Jeff Liu and everybody else says. So, you know, who knows? I mean, we're only, you know, we're not that far from summer. So I don't know how significant uh, the the trends will, will change by then. But uh, potentially, if, if demand does uh, uh, take a step down, you know, that that could help alleviate some of the congestion as well. I mean, it's a, it, it's, <laughs> it, it's, it's not a pleasant way for uh to alleviate congestion from an airline perspective you know to, to have less demand but it could essentially have the same effect absolutely and you know this it, the cuts in new york as as bad as they could be for for travelers um will only drive yields up if demand holds holds true so that could mm -hmm. actually be very good for the airlines. of course if, if you have massive operational disruptions all of those yield gains could be lost to extra costs we shall see yeah. Yep, yep, well, yep. Jay, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, we're going to head north of the border. Hey, Jay, as promised, we're heading north of the border now to maybe somewhat cooler climbs. And let's talk about WestJet. Yeah, so WestJet, unfortunately, we don't have numbers for it because they are not a publicly traded company anymore. So they operate under different financial disclosure laws. They're... Uh, privately held. Uh, and um, so we don't know too much about them. Now, Ned did have the opportunity, as some of you may have seen in Airline Weekly, uh, this latest issue, uh, to speak with uh, one of with WestJet's uh, top executive. And uh, yeah, you can t share some of the, you know, some of the things you learned from him. Yeah, so I, I spoke to Alexis von, um, gosh, I'm going to butcher it, von Hoschenbrock uh, the other week and about WestJet, and he's their CEO. He joined the airline a little over a year ago, and he says the, the airline is seeing really strong demand this summer um, on the financial side. Uh, he didn't, he wouldn't go as far as to promise that they will be profitable. But the way he described it is, you know, where the 2022 was the big turnaround year for U.S. airlines, Canada is... Uh, a year behind. So he expects 2023 to be the the big turnaround for WestJet, Air Canada, you know, the sector there. And of course, we have to set the stage. Air Can Canada used to be a primarily two airline market, Air Canada and WestJet. Since in the last few years, we've seen a number of competitors move up. Porter Airlines, which used to be uh, just regional operations from Toronto's Billy Bishop's airport, is adding jets, expanding the way. Air Transit, a longtime leisure holiday airline, has shifted to something of a hub and spoke model around Quebec City and Montreal. And then you have all the upstarts, Jetlines, Flair, and everything. So, you know, him saying that they expect a good 2023 is good. Good considering the competitive environment, Canada's ramped up a lot. Another caveat: mm -hmm. capacity, though, is still down uh, from the pandemic, even with all the new competition. So it's it's an interesting story in Canada. Yeah, and, and some of those competitors are small, and and like you said, they they in, in to some extent they're growing, but uh, there there are a few examples of uh, some experiencing distress as well. Some of those upstarts, but the story with WestJet, I mean, they really do need to kind of right the ship, so to speak. Um, even before the pandemic, they were going through some struggles. Uh, I like to think of WestJet as a an airline that's just over the course of its over maybe two decade history, roughly, uh, j just an airline that's uh, that that's undergone increasing complexity over time. And I think that's a function of being in the Canadian market, which is relatively small. So when they first started out in the I guess late '90s or whenever it was. Um, they were, you know, very simple, low cost carrier, you know, keep, keep things, uh, you know, single fleet and, uh, single they were very product. much the, the Southwest airlines wannabe. I remember, I, I forget if they actually had a direct tie to Southwest or not, but I, I always remember the comparison was we want to be 
Southwest Airlines of Canada, basically. Very much, very much. And uh, that worked very, very well for them. And then they kind of realized at a certain point that, well, there's, you know, there's not many places we can grow. I mean, Canada's a relatively small market. We've done transborder, we've done Caribbean, you know, we've got these 737s that can only go so far. So they, you know, gradually branched out into regional flying and then they added premium products. And then ultimately they made what probably was a giant mistake. Uh, they bought a uh, small subfleet of 787s, which, uh, you know, they looked over at Air Canada. They saw Air Canada was growing. And remember the, the, the growth objective here. Air Canada was growing internationally with their wide bodies and doing so rather profitably. So they kind of had a, you know, why, why can't I do this as well? But it hasn't really worked out for them. And it, it's almost reminiscent of like <clears throat> when I think of, <clears throat> excuse me, when I think of uh, sort of, wide body order has gone bad. I think of Virgin <laughs> Australia and how they ordered triple sevens. And for years they had this little sub fleet that I had to maintain. It was just kind of a disaster for them. Uh, you know, WestJet again, we don't have the same sort of financial transparency there. So I'm going out on the limb a little bit and making this judgment, but I suspect that the wide bodies are real kind of albatross for them. And they couldn't even make it work out of Toronto. Toronto is your biggest market internationally. If you can't make the wide bodies work <clears throat> out of Toronto, well, now they're saying, okay, we're just going to bring it back to Calgary where we have more strength. Yes, you have more strength, but it's also a much, much smaller market. So, you know, they're, they're, they're really so, going to have a tough time with that. No, absolutely. And I mean, I think we all agree that they've, they've made it clear without saying it that the 787s are sort of an albatross. Uh, they canceled the rest of their order. I want to say they canceled yes. five or six planes. They had an order uh, capping the fleet at seven aircraft. And so when I spoke to Von Hushenbrock, he basically said, you know, like you said, we don't have, we, we can't split this small fleet over three hubs. They had them in Toronto, Calgary, and Vancouver, and they're concentrated them in Calgary. And you know, his argument is, is Calgary is the only place that they have, um, they have the feed to support long haul operations. So it's not just going to be the local market. It's going to be all the markets that connect into Calgary. And they do have a lot of feed there. That is going to be their one quote unquote point in, you know, connecting hub. And they're, they're doing new service to Tokyo with the 787 European service. Um, but then it's, you touch on the point of their whole network shift is, is they WestJet had moved into something of a national competitor to Air Canada and they're really retrenching from that. They're focusing their capacity in Western Canada. They're not leaving markets necessarily, though our listeners might be able to tell me a market or two in Atlantic Canada that they've exited. Um, but they're they're not flying things like you know Toronto Montreal or Toronto to Moncton. They're you know connecting Montreal and Toronto and, and maybe Moncton. I'm using that as an example to Calgary, yes, but they're they're not doing those those Eastern Canada routes, and they're really focused on Western Canada, which is interesting because. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think Eastern Canada is still the most populous part of the country, but uh... oh, very, very much so, very much so. And there's a lot of the growth has has been more dynamic. The population growth and economic growth has been more dynamic out west. Now, some of that is is linked and correlated to energy prices because of that's Alberta's economy right there is most energy. But uh, As oil even goes, going so goes Alberta. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. It's almost like, you know, think of it like the Houston of Canada or something, but uh, without the, you know, Houston's has become a more diversified economy, I think Calgary has become. But in any case, the um, I think with WestJet, even if you go back to their the good old days, so to speak, when they were making a lot of money, I think even then, most of their profits were concentrated in the West. I mean, I think Calgary was where it was, you know, where the action was. Um so there's probably a solid financial argument to be said that retrenching to Western Canada is a good strategy for, for WestJet. Yeah, or at least a best of bad alternatives. Okay. I mean, the problem is, again, that uh, you, how much can you do? I mean, it's it, Canada has, what is it, 30 million people? It's like a tenth the size of the U.S. So, you know, how much, and, and like you said, Ned, a very large portion of the population lives East. So, you know, how many planes can Western Canada support is the question. And can, can a, a city like Calgary, which is, you know, ra rather small, um, it's, I think it's the fourth biggest market in even Canada. Um, and then you start comparing it to some of the U S cities that have, you know, wide body service. And it's, it's pretty small. 
And so, you know, can it support wide bodies? The answer is probably no. Um, and they're going to try to, you know, do their best with, with what they have. So, you know, they'll, uh, so, so probably it is the right decision, but it's may not necessarily be a profitable decision, just the, uh, you know, maybe, maybe lose less money. And, yeah. you know, so yeah, you're and, right. And again, so and yeah. I'm looking quickly at the population numbers and yeah, Calgary is the fourth largest Metro in Canada. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's tiny. I mean, we've got 5.6 million in Toronto, 3.7 in Montreal and Vancouver at 2.4 million. And then you've got Calgary in fourth at 1.3 million. So yeah, 1.3, you know, that's like Vegas or something. I, I don't know what's, what's a 1 million yeah. U S comparable, but, but yeah, yeah it's, it's Asterisk, not... there's a large corporate says a uh, large corporate uh, concentration in Calgary, more so than Vancouver. I remember that from covering other other aspects of the Canadian market. But yeah, it's uh, it's not yeah, it's it's, not not even close to being Canada's largest city. Right, right. And even the corporates, it's mostly commodity based, you know, it's energies and they yeah, they they fight some, but it's, um, you know, I, I think where if you ask like, a, I don't know, just a, like think they, like I bet you Air Canada, you know, a huge amount of their profits come from those, uh, you know, I like to think like finance, consulting and legal. And, you know, these people who are just, that's what they do for a living. They just fly around, you know, auditors. Um, they, uh, people who just fly around the world for, for a living. Um, there's probably not a ton of that in, in a place like Calgary. Yeah, so yeah. it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it will be tough. I mean, you know, that said, there's really only two major airlines, as you mentioned, some of these little guys are, you know, we'll see how long they last, if they last. Um, and Air Transat's kind of a niche thing. They do a lot of their stuff is transatlantic, um, which is one reason why it was hard to compete when WestJet was doing Eastern Canada to Europe. Uh, they had to compete with Air Transat as well. And Air Transat is a pretty right. good competitor. I mean, they've got narrow bodies that they're able to do it. Uh, and in fact, WestJet used to, at, they maybe still do, I'm not sure, but they they were flying 737s from Eastern Canada, a place like St. John, for example, over to Dublin or... or I think it could reach Dublin or, um, you know, just, just some of the short, sure to haul you transatlantic, uh, routes, they were doing that. And I think it, I think those did pretty well, relatively speaking in the summers. Anyway, that's another thing about international. So seasonal, what are you going to do with those dreamliners in the winter? That's, uh, yeah, you can, you can add that. Especially <laughs> Canada where it's pretty darn cold in the winter. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. You can, uh, you know, add that to the list of, of reasons why that seven, eight decision decision, seven, eight, seven decision might've been a, a bad one, but, um, you know, perhaps you can run them down to the Caribbean. I mean, certainly fill them, but is that the optimal use for such an expensive brand new aircraft? Uh, probably not. Yeah. No, I like the way you phrase it. You know, their restructuring plan, retrenching, cutting costs, I mean, it's the least bad option probably. And, you know, they've added a bunch of 737 maxes, their order book. They're definitely doubling down on being a primarily 737 operator, not solely because they're keeping the 787s and keeping uh, two thirds of the dash eights they have. So it's uh, it's going to be interesting to watch to watch WestJet as they evolve. And unfortunately, we can't watch them financially because they are still privately held. So I know it's, I, always, um, I always root for yeah. these companies to go public so I can see their financials. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> well, Jay, with that, I think we've got a night. Uh, we've done another episode of the Airline Weekly Lounge. Uh, it's always a pleasure. Listeners, if you want to reach myself, you can reach me at er at skift.com. You can reach Jay at js at skift.com. Jay, bring it, take us out. Okay, Ned, thanks uh, to you. Thanks, everybody, for listening, and we'll see you next week. Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of the Airline Weekly Lounge podcast. Check out AirlineWeekly.com for a new issue every Monday and updates on the latest airline news throughout the week.